Welcome to the Climax Academy Live. I'm Jim Miller, the Global Training Manager. This video series we're doing gives people an overview of our equipment. And today we're going to be going uh, on the second half of our uh, FF63 flange facer operation. Uh, we had some great questions from last week, and I'll, I'll answer those at the very beginning of our live question and answer at the end. So uh, for, the, for the folks that sent those in, uh, we'll hit those first. So again, today, if you have any questions, uh, go ahead and while the video is playing, type them in at the Zoom Q&A, and either we'll get to them at the end of this session or we'll either answer them direct. So um, yeah, just any questions you might have, feel free to, to submit those. So as always, I always wanna start out with safety. Uh, I wanna make sure that my area is real clear, that all the hoses are, are out of the way. I wanna make sure that um, I really watch for any, uh, any pinch points, any trip hazards, any rotation in the machine that might come in contact with, uh, with anything else. I always wanna stress that I wanna disconnect power. Uh, in this case, it's a pneumatic uh, feed, but I wanna always disconnect power before I reach in and make any kind of machine adjustments. So uh, we probably won't run the machine today. It's a little bit loud and it's hard to hear over it. So. Uh, we'll try to do most of everything static. Um, so anyway, just, just, just for that. Always want to watch out for sharp objects. Anything that, um, anything that might uh, be sharp chips, especially, you know, this thing creates chips and those are sharp. The cutting tools are sharp. Um, just in general, I want to make sure that everything uh, in our surrounding areas is safe. So once I've checked that all out and I feel comfortable with it, um, then we'll, 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 we'll go forward. So, so again, uh, any questions you have during the video, type those in. And um, yeah, so uh, by the way, when this video starts, it'll be right where we left off last time. I think there might be a brief introduction and then it'll go right into the video. So just, just clarify that a little bit. So, okay, uh, enjoy. Welcome, uh, my name is Jim Miller, I'm the Global Training Manager, and today we're going to talk about the FF6300 flange facer. Let's talk a little bit about the features of the tool head itself, and again, when I, sometimes when I like to move this around, I like to move it um, with the, the nice uh, input gear here so I can make an exact movement. So let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about the tool head and how everything works with the tool head. So on the back of this, let me, let me go just a little bit more. On the back, I, you can see this, I have a locking uh, mechanism so that I can lock the slide so that it uh, doesn't feed in or out. I want to make sure that's loose if I'm going to do an operation, but if I'm doing something where I want the tool head to stay in an exact place, I'll go ahead and lock this down. But I have to remember that I don't want this locked while I'm moving. Likewise, on the tool head for the up and down, I have the ability to lock. Now this has a spring-loaded uh, handle, so I can move it to a convenient position so I loosen it or lock it, and then if I need that to be out of the way, I can just pull it out and turn it. And all of the, the thumb screws work the same way on this machine. So that just allows me to move that where it's convenient and then be able to loosen it. <clears throat> also, while we're talking about how I put a tool in, is I have the ability to adjust my tool geometry based on, uh, based on uh, how my, what, what exact tool I'm using. I'm going to move this up just a little bit out of the way. Okay, that's as high as I can go right there. And so if I'm using this tool here, and I'm going to go from the, you know, if I'm going to go from the outside in, then I can just change my geometry anywhere I want, and then I have the ability to just tighten this down. And wherever, it, wherever I set it, now it's tight. Now everything's tight, just by that single screw. So I can loosen that up. I can move the geometry anywhere I want. I can change the angle of the cutter. I can move it anywhere I want. I move it where I want it to be, and then I lock it down. OK, 
Okay, another nice thing about this tool head is I have a clamp on the back here. And let me, uh, let me bring that around so you can see it. I'm going to take this tool out just for safety for now. Because <clears throat> I don't really want that in there when I'm doing some of these adjustments. So I'm going to take you over here and show you. We have a, there's a ring that clamps this tool head uh, in one position, in, in the, the angle that I want. I'm going to go ahead and loosen this up. Now I can turn this to cut if I want to put a chamfer on the inside or if I want to put a chamfer on the outside. I can set this to whatever angle I want so that when I feed this, it's going to feed along that, that angle. Now another nice feature of this, I'll turn this down here so you can see, um, the, uh, the tool, the feed box, the pneumatic feed box will also bolt on this axis. So if I need to uh, make a long cut like a chamfer or a, a counterbore or even a, a, you know, even if I want to turn the OD of this, I can set this angle to whatever I want. I can put the feed box on here and now as it rotates it will feed in that axis along that angle. So that's a really nice feature. For this, for this uh, demonstration though I think I'm just going to go ahead and, and leave this set at zero. Uh, straight up and down, and that, that works good. And then I'll go ahead and tighten it back down. So now I'm going to go ahead and go around and let's talk about the uh, feed box. And so this little pin right here engages in this castle. When that pin is engaged, then the, the clutch is engaged, and now the feed box will only go in the direction that it's going to feed. So I can turn it this way, but I can't go against it. So this way means that it's feeding towards me, and I can't go away. So that means that it, the clutch is engaged. If I put this in neutral, now I can turn it either direction. So Remember, neutral, I can go either direction. Engaged, I can only go the direction that it's going to feed in. Okay, so I'm going to leave this engaged. I'll take the handle off. I'm going to adjust my feed with the amount of feed with this knob here. So with the, with the feed engaged, uh, now the control of the amount of feed is based on this dial. So what I like to do is, I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead and place my mag indicator, the same one that I used to level. I'll go ahead and place that on the turning arm so that it's so that it's well secured. So that it's on a nice good piece of material that is going to be magnetic. I can either put the, the mag on the tool arm or I can put and then the indicator on the end of the arm or the mag on the end of the arm because I want to measure the amount of movement between the tool head and the arm. So I'm going to go ahead and lock this down. I'll set my dial to zero. Now my feed is engaged. So when I make one full revolution, it's going to tell me how much this advances in the direction that it's going to feed. So I can just, I can just move this nice and slowly. Notice my tool is way away from my workpiece. Okay, so it didn't move at all. Zero feet. The air caddy is how I operate the, uh, the FS-63. So the air coming in to the unit, I have to open the valve. I have an automatic oiler. And then I have an air separator. So this... This bubble here shows me that while the machine's rotating, and let me, let me go ahead and demonstrate that. As the machine is rotating, I want to watch for a drip of oil. So I want about one drip for every 15 seconds. That's a good kind of rule of thumb. And I can just lift this up, make an adjustment, and then pop it back down. 
and that sets my amount of airflow. And then this is a water separator. I want, I always want to operate the machine with this air caddy in place because it, what it does is it gives me the ability to shut everything off, uh, emergency shut off. I can turn it back on, but every time I turn it off or if I kink the hose, I've got, I've got to restart it. Okay, so I want to open the air valve to my feed mechanism and it has to be all the way open. So with the feed all the way open, now when I control the RPM, I can hear the little valve opening and closing as it goes past this cam. And that's how my air, my air feed system works, is by sending air through this valve out to the feed box. So I'm going to turn this to zero. I want to make sure that this is all nice and, and secure so that it doesn't move on me as it rotates. And I want to make sure that it's clear all the way around it. So now when I rotate the, the uh, uh, tool head around, it's going to tell me how much it's going to feed in. So now I've, I've set in five thousandths in one revolution. And so what I use as a rule of thumb for facing is if I'm, if I'm just trying to get metal off the face and I'm, I'm in a hurry, I just want to rough, I go, I go as much as 10 thousandths per revolution. But I generally don't want to go much more than that because that will leave a really rough finish. So if I'm doing finishing cuts, I go from 3 to 5 thousandths for finish and I go from 8 to 10 for roughing. So right now, it's set right where I want it. But I'm going to show you again how to make that how to make that change so we can uh, so you can play with that a little bit. So this dial is what this dial is what makes the feed increase or decrease. So right now I'm gonna I'm gonna open the feed up and give it a little bit more. So now let's test it again. So I'll go ahead and set that to zero. So now I'm feeding about nine thousandths. I'll give it just a little bit more. So I'm just going to give this just a little bit more feed. So I'll reset this to zero. Okay, I'm still about nine thousandths. So, so let's make. It a little bit more. Okay, right at 10 thousandths, exactly. So uh, that's how I set my feed rate. I always like to set my feed rate prior to um, making the two, prior to the tool coming down and being close to the uh, work surface. So uh, I always like to make all my adjustments uh, in a safe manner away from anything that might be uh, uh, contacting. So I'm going to go ahead and set the tool till it just barely touches the work surface and then I'll show you how to set our depth of adjustment. I'll go ahead and take this off. I like to always disengage the air for safety uh, if I'm making any adjustments to the tool. So I'll have to, uh, I'll have to disengage the feed. So remember with the feed disengaged I can turn the I can turn the tool head to either side. I'm going to go ahead and bring this down. So I'll bring the tool right over the workpiece. I'll bring the, the tool head right down to the till the piece touches. And, and what I like to do is I like to take a uh, I like to take a small piece of paper. I'll bring this down until it just barely touches the paper, until it tears the paper. So then I know that I'm setting the, 
the tool right at the top, right at the top of the workpiece. So I'm going to go ahead and put this on the movable part of the, of the tool head. So remember, I came down and touched off with a piece of paper. I'm going to set this at zero, and now I'm going to go ahead and uh, I, I'm going to go ahead and move this down exactly ten thousandths. So now that I've adjusted that, I can go ahead and lock the screw, take my indicator off. So now when I run when I run this machine, it's going to feed that way. Ten thousandths per revolution, and I'm ten thousandths uh, per revolution down inside the, the workpiece. So I'm going to go ahead and hook the air back up. So the pneumatic conditioner of the feed is open. This machine always drags the tool head. So it always, the arm, the tool head is always behind the arm. And so it rotates on a clockwise rotation looking down on the machine. So that means I had to have a left-handed tool to go from the outside in. When I originally set it up, I had it set up from the inside out. So uh, it's easy to make that mistake, and so this brings up a good point as to why you want to know the difference between right hand and left hand. And uh, so that was a good example of, of why we would do that. Okay, so now we're ready to make the cut. 10 thousandths depth, 10 thousandths speed. I won't let it cut for too long, it's just a matter of watching it turn for a while. Okay, so one of the things I'd like to highlight, if you'll just, if you notice, what I do as I'm cutting, if I need to stop, I always stop the feed first and let it go around a few times with no feed pressure, and then I stop the rotation, and that will save me from breaking an insert. So. Now I'll go ahead and I'll disengage the feed. I'll go ahead and, and move the tool head away from the workpiece. And now I can rotate it around. And I want to zoom in and kind of show you the nice uh, finish that we had. So uh, th even though this is just a, a couple of revolutions here, uh, I want you to see uh, that that actually puts a a very nice finish uh, uh, on that workpiece uh, that we just cut. So now that we've watched that uh, video, uh, we'll go ahead and move into our question and answer period. And again, we've got some questions that came in from last week, and we'll go ahead and do those first. So John's going to go ahead and, and read those questions to me. What benefit is this flange spacer versus the flange spacer used on the BB5000? Excellent question. I get these a lot. I mean, a big part of what we do is application support, right? So defining a machine for any particular application. And you've touched on a real good subject here. A lot of times, uh, now this flange in particular, you couldn't do with a BB-5 just because it's a little bit bigger uh, than, than we have a facing head for the BB-5. Uh, BB-5 goes to 24, and this is a little over 25. So in this particular flange, you couldn't use a boring bar, a flange or a, a facing head on a boring bar 
But um, that's always a, a, a thought that we have uh, whenever we're looking at an application and we have a bore and a face, uh, that's one of the, the criteria that we look for. Now, is it more difficult to set up a bar than it is a single plane chuck? And in this case, I think it would be a little more difficult to set up a bar because you'd have to have a bearing down below and then you'd have to come up with some way to mount a bearing up above because you have to have at least two bearings in any setup. Some setups you can have two bearings above the flange, right? And we call that a cantilever mount where the bar hangs below the second bearing and then you work uh, down below that. That's a, that's a real good possibility. Uh, it limits the distance that that second bearing can be away from that face. Typically we wanna be no more than about seven times the diameter of the bar, right? For rigidity. Because otherwise you get further than that from a bearing and then it be, the setup becomes flexible. So, um, so that's, that's, a, that's always a question we want to look for is, can I do this with a flange facer more efficiently or can I do it with a boring bar more efficiently? So again, in this case, I would have to go to a three and a half inch bar to be able to face that big. So then I've got a three and a half inch bar and the shortest three and a half inch bar I can come up with is four footer, that's pretty heavy. And then I gotta have two big bearings. So this is a much more efficient setup for this diameter flange. Now, I apologize for that long way around the barn, but I kind of wanted to fully explain that, that, um, that oftentimes there's more than one machine that can do an application. And the, the trick to that or the goal to that is look for the least amount of setup, the most ease of setup, and the most efficient way to, to, to machine that flange off there. And so in this particular case, a flange facer would be really hard to beat, um, but, but great, great question. Can you adjust the following feed rate RPM and does it feed both in and out and up and down automatically? Okay, great. Um, so FF63, I'll start with this, FF63, uh, the feed rate has to be adjusted while the machine is static. In other words, I adjust the feed and then I turn it on to check the feed rate. So um, um, prior models and other models, I can adjust the feed rate while the machine is running. Now there's real no advantage to that in my mind because I wanna know what kind of finish I want prior to starting, right? So I wanna preset the feed with a dial indicator, know exactly what my feed is, and then I wanna let it run its course, right? If I change the feed rate during the operation, I'm gonna affect my finish. I'm gonna have a real smooth area where the feed is slow, and I'll have a more coarse area where the feed is high. So to me, it's not an advantage to adjust the feed while the machine is running. I do have the ability to adjust the RPM, to affect maybe taking some vibration out or whatever, but, um, but it's not a great advantage to adjust the feed in, in my mind. Now, that being said, uh, to answer the question more specifically, this feed box can be uh, directed forward or reverse. So I just have to turn it over to change the direction. Um, and then I can take this feed box and put it on either the radial axis or the axial axis. So, um, so the answer is yes. The, uh, the, the feed rate can be adjusted in either direction on either axis, and it's infinitely adjustable from zero to about 35 thousandths, and the RPM is also infinitely adjusted from a low RPM to a high RPM. Um, and I, yeah, so hopefully that answers that. Regarding the pneumatic supply of the equipment, is it a good option or is hydraulics recommended? Another excellent question. So you have the option of hydraulic or pneumatic. Now really, um, it really is job site specific. Um, every FF63 it requires air uh, for the feed system. So no matter what, I have to be able to bring air to the machine. Now, that being said, um, the, the benefit of, of a hydraulic rotation is for the larger diameters, I want a lower RPM. 
And hydraulic has a, 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 more, a more fine adjustment at that lower RPM range. I have a little more control over the RPM at that, at that lower range with hydraulics because hydraulics is a flow, right? I have the appropriate motor displacement that I can control the flow without it cogging. And so um, there's some real advantages to hydraulic. It, it'll, it's 100% duty cycle. I can run it uh, long periods of time. I can have the power unit in a remote location uh, so they don't have to be right near that, uh, that, that high horsepower, you know, 10 horsepower motor running. Um, it also, there's some disadvantages. I have to be close enough to the hydraulic that I don't have, a, you know, lines that are too long. Um, it is an electric motor that runs the hydraulic. So in some environments, uh, I can't have an electric motor, an open brush motor, or even, a, even a, any kind of electric motor. So uh, in some job locations, uh, pneumatic is preferred because everything around me is running pneumatically. And so I have plenty of volume of air. Uh, it, it, um, they both operate uh, perfectly to the machine capabilities. Let's put it that way. Um, there's no deficiency in running pneumatic over hydraulic. Uh, there's just some minor advantages to hydraulic over pneumatic and pneumatic over hydraulic. So it, it's, it's kind of a non-answer really. I mean, it really does depend on uh, what your job site can support. Does the tool head heavy scale to set the angle by? Yes. So I know we talked about that in the video, right? The ability to turn that head and do chamfers or bevels or even a, you know, an O-ring groove or a, or a ring joint uh, operation. And so um, I want to know about, you know, close where I'm putting that angle. So on one side of the clamp that holds the tool head, it's got a zero to 45 either direction. And so uh, that, it, it, that, and there's a little tick mark on the side of the, of the uh, slide that tells me where that angle is set to. Now, if I have to have this angle perfect, then obviously I want to set up a uh, uh, angle block and a dial indicator and travel that to make sure that I'm at a perfect angle. But for most purposes, if I'm just cutting, let's say I'm cutting a well joint that's 37 and a half degrees, um, I can set the, the, the angle just by the, by the graduated scale and that's, that's more than adequate. So. What is the amount of travel the tool head has? Yeah, so the standard tool head for the FF63 is four inches. I have four inches of axial travel. So, um, you know, like a gray lock has maybe a, depending on the diameter of the, of the flange, it has maybe a, a long enough angle, a two inch angle. Not usually do you see in a flange facing operation, the need to travel more than four inches, but that also doesn't limit the reach. The reach is the length of the tool. So you could have a longer tool and then still have four inches of travel above that, so. What is the max speed rate? Why would I need more than 10,000? Yeah, good question. I, I kind of alluded to this a little earlier in that question that we had, uh, but you know, didn't answer it completely. So the range of feed is obviously zero. Yeah, you know, I can set it to where there's no feed at all. And then my maximum feed is around 35,000. This is a clutch feed, right? So uh, unloaded clutch will uh, feed a little bit more than when you apply a load to it. Um, there's very little uh, slip in, or inefficiency in a clutch. They're pretty, pretty darn good. Um, so the benefit of having that high of a feed rate when I said, well, I probably only wanna have like maximum of 10, maybe 15 thousandths per revolution for machining. Um, but the benefit of that higher feed rate is, so let's say I'm doing a raised face flange and um, I want a clearance area you know, for the tension of the bolts, and then I want the raised face for a gasket seal. Well, oftentimes on that face, I need to apply what they call a phonographic finish or a ring finish. Um, and so that's like a spiral, like a record uh, phonograph, right? And so um, what I want to do is I want to do the profile. I want to machine the profile so that all the pitting and all the corrosion is out of that surface. 
And then I want have a, a, a form type tooling. Now I won't say it's necessarily a sharp tool. It, maybe looking at it, it would look like a lathe type tool, an included 60 degree angle possibly. Um, but then it'll have a, a form nose on it because generally the specification for that phonographic finish, is it has a call out for what the diameter or what the radius of that point should be. Uh, some do and some don't. Some want a dead sharp, some want a 15 degree or a 15 uh, thousandths radius, a 7 thousandths radius, up to a 32, right? A 32 radius is a big radius. Nevertheless, um, so whatever the radius, whatever the form of the, of the root of the, of the phonograph is called out, and then the number of serrations are based on the calculation of how much feed rate per revolution. So I haven't ran across too many uh, phonographic uh, callouts that are more than 35 thousandths incrementally per revolution. So uh, that's that's kind of a good safe number there. Ho hopefully that answered that, that question. Do you need a second feed feed block to feed the tool in, into the face if making a groove? Yeah, not a second uh, tool block, but this tool this tool head or the feed box, I'm sorry, has uh, two screws that hold it on, right? So when I slide the, the uh, feed mechanism uh, barrel out, I can turn this feed box over to feed the other direction. Likewise, I can take this feed box off and put it on the other axis. So I can only run one feed unit at a time with the machine. Uh, either I'm in radial feed or I'm in axial. I, I cannot run them both uh, at the same time. So I think that was the, the gist of the question that um, I can only run one feed box and I can either have it on the radial or the axial and, um, and that, that, that's it. So looks like that's all the questions for our time together today, um, but great questions. Uh, some of those were from last week and then some of them were new from this week. So um, keep those questions coming. We, that's what we we kind of that's, that's what we do is we like to answer questions about how our equipment works and we see all kinds of odd applications that these machines are applied to and so um, there's there's not much we haven't seen over the years um, some of us more than others so anyway um, keep those questions coming and and if you have any more after this time's done go ahead and submit those to ask cpmt at cpmt.com and we will uh, be happy to answer those or we'll have a live stream on those uh, questions we'll maybe sometime we'll just sit down without a machine here and we'll open it up to uh, you know the top 10 questions that we got that week or that or that that time period so thanks for joining and we'll see you next time